Hello, Illinois State University. I'm Dr. Scott Jordan, Chair of the Department of Psychology. And in celebration of Black History Month, I am so pleased that my colleague, Dr. Eric Wesselman, has organized tonight's animated conversation with the world-renowned animator, the one, the only, Mr. Larry Houston. Hi, everyone. Uh, go ahead, man. Oh, you're saying hi, Cole. Huh? I just said hi, that's all. <laughs> Very cool. Um, before I introduce Dr. Wesselman, I'd like to draw your attention to another event that's taking place um, in celebration of Black History Month. And as you can see on the screen behind me, on Thursday, February 25th at seven o'clock, the Zoom channel to be announced. Um, we'll have our third installment of what we call ReggieCon, a con that asks the question, what is your story? Uh, this month's theme is Wakanda for All to Live as One Tribe, and we'll be discussing ta Coates' run on the Black Panther series, A Nation Under Our Feet. You can see I have people, we have experts on this panel. You can see in the upper right there, Mr. Mr. Victor Dandridge, the hardest working man in comics, and of course, our very own Dr. Wesselman. And then we have over there yours truly. <laughs> and then yeah, just yeah. In the middle of that, Dr. Teresa Rojas. Yeah. Um, we call ourselves the ReggieCon crew. We have guest panelists and we have tons of fun. Admission is free and it's open to anyone who has a Zoom account. So once we send the flyer out, feel free to send it to family and friends and the whole world's welcome. Um, just another quick note, uh, Mr. Houston's gonna be joining us for ReggieCon in May when we celebrate Asian Pacific Heritage Month. And the topic of that, ReggieCon will be Eyes Unclouded by Hate, the Spirit of Hayao Miyazaki. We cannot wait to discuss uh, Princess Mononoke together. So um, Dr. Westerman is going to interview Mr. Houston for roughly about 45 minutes, at which point we'll open the chat for Q&A. Um, so, um, Ladies and gentlemen, with no further ado, my partner in crime, psychology, and all things pop culture, Dr. Eric Wesselman. Thank you, Dr. Jordan. Um, so uh, it's my great pleasure to be able to uh, moderate this discussion with uh, Mr. Houston tonight. Um, Mr. Uh, Houston is a producer, director, storyboard artist, writer, and consultant, perhaps best known as the director of the four, to, four of the five seasons of X-Men the Animated Series, which ran from 92 to 96. Um, mm -hmm. He's also the uh, 2018 Ink Pot winner uh, in animation from Comic-Con International, which is the uh, organization that hosts San Diego Comic-Con. Uh, Mr. Houston took his first animation job at Filmation Studios in 1980. Uh, and was the first black Saturday morning storyboard artist in Hollywood. In addition to his work as director on X-Men, he also worked <coughs> on various other projects, uh, including the well-known titles such as G.I. Joe, Care Bears, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and Transformers. Um, he has also done some work in comics, such as the uh, uh, mini comics that came with the He-Man action figures in the 1980s, um, personally, I can say that Mr. Houston had a huge impact on my childhood as he had many, as he has impacted many, many others of my generation. Uh, now with Disney Plus picking up and streaming X-Men the Animated Series, uh, his work can entertain and inspire a new generation. So please well, uh, join me in welcoming Mr. Larry Houston. Hi everyone, nice to meet you. It's, uh, I'm getting used to all these Zooms now since that's the only way to talk to people these days. So, um, yeah. Hi, everyone. And um, it's been, I've had a great career. I mean, I'm retired right now, but I've had a great career starting about, like you said, about 1980, working as a storyboard artist at Filmation and, you know, moving through working in different departments. Um, I became a director on G.I. Joe and I got a chance to write like on Spider-Man and Amazing Friends. I wrote an episode of G.I. Joe, Cohorts and Cannons. And once I got to be a director, I started being just being a director in a lot of other shows. And that was a lot of fun, you know. Uh, yeah, I know I'm glossing over a lot of stuff here, but I'm just trying to give an overview of uh, of what I've been able to do. Um, the one thing I I'm most happy about is the X Men because that was one of the shows since I was a little kid. Uh, I've always been a fanboy, you know, going to going to the drugstore, off the spinner racks, getting the comic books, reading it like crazy. Um, I got to the point where when I was getting the books and not understanding what I was reading, I, I kept going to my mom saying, what does this word mean? What does this word mean? And she, she eventually bought me a dictionary and said, here, you figure it out, you know? 
it, it did help my vocabulary in elementary school. And um, it, it was, it was, uh, it was you know, reading Jack Stanley dialogue and Jack Kirby layouts. And there's another artist named Gil Kane and John B. Summers. They were like, just so invigorating my imagination. I just wanted to draw all the time. You know, elementary school, you, you'd have these folders, one folder for arithmetic, one for math, you know, that kind of stuff. And on the back, I'd always be drawing pictures and stuff, just trying to you know, capture what was happening in my mind and, and, and being an artist and just trying to be creative. And um, from that point forward, I, if, you, if I'm gonna fast forward to like high school where I met like-minded artists like myself and we were in high school and we'd go to art class and we would for our own pleasure, um, I draw up my own comic books. I drew up my own Avengers, my own Justice League. We were all just making up our own little comic books. It was a lot of fun. You know, when you, especially, you know, so I found, oh, I found some more nerds just like me. Great. <laughs> and um, that's what we did. We just spent the, you know, 10th grade, 11th grade, 12th grade, just drawing our own books and having some fun that way. Um, but the, when I was graduating high school, um, my mom didn't, she didn't say this literally, but she's, I told her, you know, I want to be a comic book artist working for Marvel Comics. And she'd say, that's nice, but you need to get a real job, you know? So I kind of ventured this way. And uh, for about seven years, I got a job fixing computers for a living. And I did that for like almost seven years. You know, seven years of good income, you know, fixing computers and learning, going here and there and stuff. Very stable income. But sometime near the end of the seventh year, I was getting so bored, so bored with the computer. And I had friends that were working at Hannibal Bear, working at Disney, telling me, come on over, you should do it. You should do this, you should do that. I went, okay. So I, I decided I'd give it a shot. I, Filmation was offering like, uh, I think it was a layout work, a layout artist. I had no idea what the hell that was, but I tried, okay, what the hell, let me try it. And I get, took the test twice, yeah, failed twice. And I was thinking, I was thinking, oh my God, what am I doing? And, but the, the artist, the, the guy in charge of layout, what's the name, um, Herb Hazeltine. And in my portfolio, all of those comic books I was drawing in high school for fun, he saw that. And he said, you know, you might be able to, you know, you might be more appropriate for doing a storyboard artist as opposed to layout, which I had no idea what it was, but I didn't say it. I just followed him upstairs. He introduced me to the, um, the supervisor of storyboards. He gave me a test. I took it home. I didn't think it was that hard. Brought it back the next day and I impressed him. And apparently what he gave me was, um, it was a live script everybody was working on at the same time. And he liked my drawing so much, he put it into the show and hired me that same day. And that's how I got into animation. That was my first job. And the, sh the show you like, the stuff that we, I was doing in high school was just fun stuff, but you never know what little pieces will help you to do, you know, to prepare you for something that, an, an opportunity that comes in the future. And that's what happened with me. I, it all happened by serendipity. Things came together at the right time. And, um, you know, and the other thing I figured out way later is that if I had called up the head of storyboard to get a job, I probably would have never gotten anywhere. But because the head, the, the, the head of layout brought me to the head of storyboard, I got a fantastic introduction. And basically it's like, okay, here's the opportunity. Now I got to show what I can do. And I, I did, I impressed them. And that's how I got into, into, into animation. And I never looked back, computers go by. Computers and animation, when, is, when will that ever cross? It never crossed my mind that that would ever come together. And yeah, it did later on, but that's how I got into animation. And from that point forward, I, I was storyboard artist, a director, and I, and it was just been a lot of fun. Um, and about 1980, 81, that's when a lot of the um, um, anime stuff was just coming over into America. And if some of you remember the giant um, laser disc, it looked like Domino's Pizza, you know, it was about super big. 
at Filmation, we'd put him into a player and watch Miyazaki films because we'd go down to Little Tokyo and buy them, put them on and watch it. All Japanese have no idea what's going on. Blah, 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 all of the language. But it didn't matter because Miyazaki was such a good storyteller. You could, except for the subtext, you know exactly what was going on, the way the shots are, were made. And for us, it was like, it's like a door had opened in our imagination because up until that point, it was Scooby-Doo left, Scooby-Doo right, you know, that's all, medium shots. And you get to Miyazaki, you got up shots, you got cameras moving all around the scenes, you got very creative shots. And it's like, it was like stunning for us to see that back in the 80s. And for me, I just kind of like, throughout osmosis, watched the same shows over and over and over again, Kaliosha's Castle, Laputa, uh, uh, what's another one? Um, um, the the, uh, the, the Totoro. witch, Totoro, and, and the and the witch, the girl witch, Kiki's delivery service, stuff like that. And I I just gobbled them all up. And uh, there were some aerial combat shows like uh, Area eighty eight and some other other shows that I can't remember right now. But it was all watching to your imagination. So it was myself. Um, Rick Holberg, he's an artist for Marvel, and Will Minio was an artist for Marvel in DC. And so we we're all like three, 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 three friends, three cabinet, what's the word? Three caballeros. Yeah, that's the word. Um, and we just kind of floated through the industry, working and making different shows. Um, Will left the X Men to create the show called uh, Exo Squad, and he, he got that off the ground. And we were just having a lot of, we were having a lot of fun between the eighties and nineties, working on all the adventure shows that came out then. And I was doing stuff here, doing stuff there. Uh, it was, it was a good times. And I think I should let you answer a question because I've been babbling a long time. Go ahead. <laughs> well, you actually, you actually covered uh, several of my first few questions. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so actually, um, so, you know, you, you sort of talked about, um, the various different things you've done in the industry. Um, I would like to uh, ask you a bit about, um, you know, how you uh, were the first black storyboard artist uh, in Hollywood at Filmation. And um, I'm just a little, uh, I would like to hear more about your experiences at that time and, um, and maybe also just kind of see your view on how the industry maybe has changed in terms of, uh, of diverse representation. Uh, back then in 1980, um... I did not, I didn't have the knowledge that, you know, there were, were no African-American artists at the time. I was looking for a job. <laughs> I wanted to get paid. And so when I got the job, I was great. You know, they gave me a table, a room, and I started working. But fast forward about maybe about 20 years later, uh, there's a guy named Floyd Norman, who's actually, he actually was the first black animator at Disney working on, um, 101 Dalmatians and we were at lunch and he, he he casually mentioned that you know you broke a glass ceiling I'm going what the hell are you talking about and then he told me you know I was the first one actually hired for that job because like Floyd had done storyboards but he never got hired for that job he did it on 100 you know he would do a sequence here and there stuff like that and so I had to go backwards and talk to my friends who were working with me at the time and do some research and it's like, oh, I guess I was. <laughs> I did not know that. At the time, at the time, it was more of a meritocracy back then, because, especially at Filmation. If you had the talent, you got hired. Because after I got hired, I think like four or five other black artists got hired after me. I, I happened to open the door and they, they saw that I worked out and then they just started bringing other people in. Um, but it was, yeah, it Filmation, the, the guy in charge of that, uh, studio his name was um uh, Lou Scheimer and he was like one of these owners that if you can imagine someone who's already got wealth and doesn't need to do this but he he would wake up every day and enjoy going into an animation studio he actually loved animation he loved the artist and to give you an example back when 80 I don't I'm not sure when they had a, a strike the unit had a strike um, he was on a picket line with us. He, he agreed with us. Uh, so he was like one of these guys, he was for the, for the employee. 
and he tried he did his best to keep the work in in the states to keep us working uh because later i think later on like five or six years later a lot of the um work went overseas and so a lot of people lost their jobs but it, he was like one of the guys that would uh fight for uh American jobs to keep him here. He was a nice guy, really nice guy. Um, and so uh, the, what I can say about that is that the atmosphere of working, I mean, we had different people working. We had, there are a lot of, uh, I know a lot of women uh, uh, storyboard people that were working on the adventure shows or the comedy shows. So if you had the talent, you got in the door. And so it was really good, good times back in the eighties. So. It's, uh, when I was when I left filmation to go to Marvel, um, I was the only one. <laughs> I was the only black guy there. But um, the another lady who who worked with me, her name was uh, Lonnie Lloyd. Um, she worked with me at filmation, and, and I told them about her, and she came in, and she got hired over there too. Then after that, they had more uh, women uh, storyboard art, artists come over there, and a couple of directors and stuff like that. So. Yeah, a lot of us did, you know, can you do the work? Are you good? Got hired. Yeah, that's what the atmosphere was like back then. Cool, thank you. Um, it's all the topic of uh, you know, breaking glass ceilings. Um, you um, have also mentioned on your website, for example, that um, you were the first person to develop uh, the character of, of Black Panther in the sort of animated universe, right? Oh, yes, yeah. Yeah, so if you could tell us a little bit about that process and, and the impact that that then had on uh superhero storytelling what happened with the black panther was that well let me back up on the x-men um i did something i was not authorized to do which was um you'd have a story going on with the x-men whatever the story was and once in a while I would, I would drop in other marvel characters like in the background over here or over here somewhere and my philosophy of doing that was that when I was a kid in the 60s, Stanley would have this, you'd be reading this book on Spider-Man and suddenly in one panel, you see Thor whoop, go by and the character would react to it, say, hey, watch where you're going. And then below it, you see this little captain saying, if you wanna see where Thor is going by issue, journey to mystery number such and such. Stanley was basically cross promoting his books within a book. That's what he was doing because at the time, Marvel was of um, DC Comics, which was called National Periodic Publications back then. So he was cross promoting the books, but what he didn't know was that for me, it was like a kid going, oh my God, you know, it's like there's Thor in a Spider-Man book. And if you had read DC Comics, that never happened. You know, every, every story you read at DC was all self-contained and it had nothing to do with the story over here. Okay, so for me, I got a chance, the characters were gonna go to Africa you know, Magneto's collecting the mutants to go to his island. So I said, hey, he's in Africa. Hey, let's put Black Panther right there, you know? So I added Black Panther. He's in the foreground watching Magneto land the spaceships in the background. Now, if you were a regular person watching the show, that character would mean nothing to you. It's just a, like a pedestrian on the side over here. But if you were a comic book person, you knew who that character was. and to me, it also what it, what happened was by doing this, I was able to generate a lot of interest in the, in the episodes for the viewer. Because the viewer, you know, I did a lot of those cameos for the viewer, uh, who knew the fans, who knew the show, and they could take get excitement about seeing that there maybe is a larger Marvel universe within this story we're trying to tell, and so that was the genesis of of putting him into the show. And I would drop in a lot of other characters here and there, you know, Doctor Strange and Thor and all over the place. But I dropped them in in strategic spots so that for interest for the kids, but also it made the story better by adding, like when Dark Phoenix, or I think it's Dark Phoenix, when she turns on her powers and becomes evil and takes leaves the earth, all of these characters that have abilities that could detect her, you know, you check, you know, they, they, they react to her power suddenly blossoming and that that added to the to the to the thrill of the story and it was like something that it was, like i said it was unauthorized there was a in i think it's the first season 
I tried to draw Spider-Man like on a building watching something over here. And when I submitted the character into the, um, to be approved, they said, no, you can't use Spider-Man. And I, I went, why? And they went, they never told me. So I went, okay, fine. I just let it go. But when I saw a chance, they had a show called, um, oh crap, uh, Slave Island. And the writer wrote Mutant 1, 2, 3, 4, because they didn't really know the mythology. So I, I physically brought my books from home, brought them to work. There was no, zip, no, no internet. So I put them on a Xerox machine, I had to copy them, hand it off to the, to the character designer. I said, okay, make this mystique, make this blah, make this sunfire, make blah, blah, blah. I, I populated it with Marvel characters, but I kept the original names, mutant one, two, three, four, five. Put it through the system, didn't hear a word. I said, ah, now I got it. So all of those cameos you saw were never, when it went to the system, I never called them Thor. I never called them Dr. Strange. I never called them whatever their names were. They were like alien observer or alien whatever or mutant this or mutant that, but I never used their real names. Even the Hulk, we used the Hulk robot once and we called them the prehistoric something something. Uh, we just, and when we submitted it, it was all in black and white, it had no green color. So they just, they just thought of it, oh, caveman, okay, <laughs> went through. <laughs> that kind of stuff. So that's how we were. I was able to add the Black Panther to the show. Uh, was I just? I, oh, he was called um, African Mutant Number Three. That one I do remember. So that's how he got into the show. I I was later when I left the X Men and produced the uh, Fantastic Four. One of the things I, I told him that I wanted to do was do to actually do a Black Panther episode. And so later on, I got a chance to. Uh, to adapt, I think it's issue 52 and 53. It's like a two-parter. We adapted that into one, one episode of the Black Panther versus the Fantastic Four. And um, I almost took, literally, almost, I took panels from the comic book and animated it in different places. So if you have the, if you have the comic book and you look into the show, you say, oh, look, that's that. That's on page 17. Well, that's, on, you know, I took shots and put it into the show. So they're like literally animated shots into the show so that that's my involvement with i with uh, black panther i was able to do the first two appearances animated appearances of the character so i know um you uh pre-covid you know you go to a lot of conventions and then chat with a lot of fans um uh what were some some uh some of your favorite fan mem fan memories of you know them sharing with uh what things like this episodes of the Black Panther and things like that, what did that mean to them? Um, a, a lot of the episodes, a lot of the people who uh, who were really fond of the uh, Black Panther actually didn't know I was African-American director. They'd see me and going, they were like, oh my God, you know, you're, you're, you're who you are. And uh, I didn't know that. And, you know, and I want to try and be a director like you in the future, that kind of stuff, which was, that was kind of nice, you know, you know, to show them what what's what is possible, um, a lot of a lot of them was like, "Thank you, you made my childhood so much enjoyable." It came at the right time. Um, we helped helped them through some rough spots. I mean, some some um, some of the things that that they would tell us was quite heartening, you know, because um, there was literally there was like uh, uh, a, uh, one of the fans was a short, he was a short, I mean, he was a man when he was talking to us, but he was, say so he grew up short and being bullied a lot. And he took the, he took heart of Wolverine taking on this gigantic guy called Sabretooth and not backing off, you know, and, and being very aggressive and standing up for himself. And he said, watching that show, watching Wolverine in the show actually gave him confidence and it gave him enough, um, cognitive um, maturity to try and get over that 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 hump in his life so that he be, he could stand up to the bullies and gave him more uh, words or I'm not sure what the word is but it helped him over that period of time yeah. um, other people other ones we met were like people um, you know like other minorities or like uh, a gay, lesbian, or trans, and stuff, and everybody kind of related to the 
out, you know, being an outsider in the X-Men and they, they saw themselves in different, different characters all over the place. And so they, for them, it gave them um, um, somebody to identify with, to help them over the, um, through that period of time, like between your nine and 15, somewhere up in there, it gave them something to hang on to and to uh, um, just help them, you know, help them mature so that they can handle stuff on their own. So it helped that little, that, that period in the middle. Um, and uh, some people, we kids we met were, um, it helped them become, they said they want to be a writer, they want to be an artist, they want, you know, it helped them over that. Yeah, I, I love this stuff. Um, and some of them I actually hired. <laughs> it's funny, I, when I was, after the X-Men, I was working as a, on, either Fantastic Four or another show. And they said they watched my shows and they wanted to become a storyboard artist. And they, I saw their work and I, oh, I hired them. It works great. Come on in, you know, um, things like that. I, there's probably more uh, stories I can remember, but they were like, basically, I think the X-Men was at the right price at the right time for the, it was a zeitgeist for that, that era that really um, gave kids an insight as to, you know, like, why do people, let's see what, it was quoted to me, um, why do people hate us? Because they, people hate what they don't understand. I mean, I got quoted to me so many times and the writers wrote some really succinct dialogue to help kids understand or give them some, a clue as to what was going on and how, um, how to deal with the world around them with the right kind of words and understanding. Um, so, um, I, I'm out of words. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'd like to, to follow up on that. Um, you know, I sort of, um, I have my own experiences with that show because I remember when it came out, I was 10 or 12 uh, in that range. Um, but uh, I'm interested in your perspective, um, given your experiences with the breadth of sort of animation um, before, before X-Men, after X-Men, right? You know, in many ways um, that show broke a lot of ground um content wise technique wise so uh could you tell us a little bit about some of the ways that it changed uh animated storytelling it was um i guess you could say it was groundbreaking but we didn't think of it as groundbreaking we thought of it we wanted to do a good show but at that point in 1991 1992 somewhere back there the only shows that people thought were successful was either Scooby-Doo or uh, Super Friends. That's it. That's all the network said, that's the, what works. And we were trying to do some, we wanted to do something that had never been done before. You know, we, we wanted to have characters that maybe didn't get along, you know, the functional family, that kind of thing. Um, we had a character die in the first episode to try and establish the, the, the parameters of the show that it's not, this is not Super Friends. And uh, we wanted to do um, stories that connected to each other. Like it's one long, you know, what happened here does affect the next story. And, um, and have recaps at the front previously on X-Men, that kind of thing. So that, that had not been done in cartoons. And everybody's, every, I shouldn't say every, but there are a lot of executives that thought it was, it would never work. It was gonna be the worst idea ever. Um, but the one, one person did was a lady named Margaret Lesh. Now, going backwards in time, in the 80s, my two bosses were Stan Lee and Margaret Lesh. She, they were in charge of Marvel Productions. And I was like one of the co-directors co on a show called Pride of the X-Men, where we tried, to, we tried to sell the X-Men to the TV stations back then. We did a half hour special. We got toy to do some fantastic animation. And it went nowhere. They, what's a mutant? What's an X-Men? Nothing. Six years later, fast forward, she, Margaret gets hired to be the CEO of Fox Kids Network. And once she became that, she got the power to green light new shows. So the, one of the first things she did, she called me and Will Smith, myself, Will Minio, and uh, Rick Holberg, and uh, Eric Lewall. Okay, we got the X-Men, we're doing it. And so she, you know, she got the X-Men on the air, she got Batman, she got um, uh, 
uh, a lot of the a lot of the uh, uh, what oh the the tick and some other shows. She got a whole bunch of shows on the air at the same. Oh, and the Power Rangers, yeah. She got all these shows on the air at the same time, and um, you know that that's how she believed in the show. Um, all the executives below her, except for one, thought it was the worst idea possible, and they and also Marvel East had no faith in what we were doing. And they were like politically sticking their fingers in it and messing up stuff. And um, they thought, um, no, you shouldn't use the Sentinels. You got to use a Magneto. You got to use the Masters of you know the evil guys. And we're going, no, 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 no. <laughs> there's a there's a reason why I want to use the Sentinels. Sentinels are like the robotic embodiment of all the uh, the the prejudice and the uh, the uh, oppression. They're robots. And we wanted to use them as a symbol uh, in the show. And also, it was it was the only way Wolverine could attack someone because he can't eviscerate human beings. So having a robot gives him something to fight. And so, um, but there were like several, uh, maybe about two or three fights we had that people wanted to put toys here. They wanted Wolverine curtains. They wanted you know, Wolverine, Cyclops, motorcycles. And we were going, no, we don't want to do that. No, no, no. And it got to be to a point, one of the one of the uh, fights came to a point where instead of saying, can you put this in? They come to the point and say, you will do this. You will do that. And collectively, it's like six of us. We, I, This is not, the, I'm paraphrasing, but we said, if this is what you want to do, we're the wrong creative crew and all of us quit. We we're going to just walk before you guys even saw one, you know, inch of film. We were going to walk away, and we got them to back off, and so they let us do the show we wanted to do, but they all believed it was like a terrible idea, and they didn't give us any publicity, like they just kind of let us. They they figured we we're going to be one and one and done. You know, it was a bad idea, but by by doing so, they let me have total creative control. I didn't have to answer to anybody. So I just made, I said, okay, this is my second bite of the apple. I got to make this first season the best season I ever can. And so I just went through and just started adding cameos, um, ch uh, changing scripts, changing. I, I started adding stuff that wasn't in the script and trying to, and basing it upon um, being a, uh, a director and also being a fanboy and just blending the two together and, and trying to put together a nice show. And so like for me in the first season, the, the I know a lot of people enjoy the Days of Future Past, but for me, the, um, the, 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 the last three episodes, especially the last one, the final decision was my favorite because that was it. That was episode 13. I had no more episodes. I put the kitchen sink into it. I, I created like Wolverine fighting the Wolverine fighting the Sentinels in the dark. I made it all up. There are a lot of stuff like that. And I thought that was it. We had no guarantee of season two. I figured, okay, that's it. I did my best. The writers, we had our resumes. We were looking for other work. When they said, don't go anywhere. The ratings are great. You got to pick up a season two. And so that's what happened. And, that's, and then from that point on, you know, they really never gave us a, um, we're going to renew you for three more seasons. It would have been great, but everything was like season by season by season. So we never knew what we had after 13 episodes. So every time we would do like a 13 uh, episode arc and I would, they clue me on where they were going. So I would add, I would add, um, how you could, uh, breadcrumbs, little pieces that would, set up something later on based upon what they told me they were going to do that kind of stuff and and the the nice thing was that myself and the writers were all on the same page we were all fanboys we all wanted to do great dramatic storytelling and um it was lightning in a bottle because we also got some really good voice actors in canada who were not typical cartoon voices they were actually stage actors and so they knew how to put a lot into the voices to, to bring the characters alive. And um, so it, it's, it, was, it was a lot of fun seeing the um, end result 
and that it came together and that the fans supported us. You know, we, we had no idea the fans supported us at all. We were like in the dark, there's no internet guys, <laughs> you know, like this. Um, it wasn't until like the 12th episode that um, I think it was Julia Leewall went to visit Fox Studios. And she just asked him, said, does anybody like the show? And she got taken into a hallway and they had, they had bins of letters and postcards. It's like the, the Raiders of the Lost Ark and it went way back there and it went all the way to the top. And it was on both sides of the hallway. It was like, holy, you know, they like us, they like us. <laughs> So yeah, that's how we got, that's uh, how we found out that uh, we had an audience and um, and you guys supported us. So thank you. Um, so I'll uh, switch uh, tracks just a little bit um, to another um, property that you worked on that has had long reaching effects as well. Uh, and that's, uh, you worked on the original adaptation of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Oh yeah, that was a lot of fun. That was a lot of fun. No, go uh, ahead. So I'm curious, um, what was uh, so the original? So I grew up with that show as well, and I was shocked later on to find out that the original comics that it was based on were actually pretty uh, mature <laughs> in terms of comics, yes, it was, it was right. Very like hard. they weren't using those swords on robots in the in the cartoon <laughs> or in the comics. No. Um, so tell me a little bit about what it was like to adapt um, a property that was originally based on a more mature source material for a kid's show. When, uh, okay, on that show, I was more of the, uh, I was one of the story directors, but not the supervising director. Mm -hmm. And so what happened, what I remember on that show was that Eastman and Laird brought in, they were brought in either themselves or by their agent. Mm -hmm. And they convinced them to, okay, you have a very popular uh, title here, but we think we can do it. We can uh, convert it to television, but we got to do like a 180. Mm -hmm. You got to make it kid friendly, but you guys can still keep doing a comic book, but we got to do a version for television. Mm -hmm. And when they showed them, you know, what they were doing and showed them the paycheck, they went, oh, okay. And then that sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, I worked on the, the original first, I think they did two mini series and I worked on that. And when they, what that was part of what happens back then in the 80s is that they would do a little mini series and test, say, the kids like this. I mean, they did it with, with G.I. Joe. They did a five part mini series. Oh, got good ratings. And, and toy sales went up. And they did us, you know, and once that happened, they said, okay, we're going to commit to 65 episodes. G.I. Joe and, Tra and Turtles, that's when they, the doors open, floodgates open, and we said, okay, let's, let's, let's do it. Um, over the next two years on Turtles, I, um, I think I did 118 episodes of storyboards. It was a lot of work. It was a lot of fun though, because the guys that, you know, the, the, the directors in charge, supervising directors in charge, as long as, you didn't, as long as you didn't do anything crazy, they let you just make up stuff, draw stuff. You could just, you could just pour in your, your fanboy stuff into the show and they went for it. It was like, it was great, you know. It was a lot of it's a lot of fun. We don't have the constraints of like you can't do this, you can't do that. You just have to stay within. It's like a within the parameters of television, but you could just have fun and, and direct it and have uh, just fun things happening, kawabanga pizza stuff and everything else going on. Um, but yeah, that's how that got off the ground. And oh, a little thing I remember was that. Um, they had, they had actually approached Marvel Productions first. And this happened also with uh, The Simpsons. They approached Marvel first to try and sell it to Marvel, but Marvel was so inundated with all the uh, with, uh, Hasbro stuff we were doing. Every, every toy had a TV show. It was like Jim, Glow Friends, Glow Worms, uh, uh, that thing, uh, what is that thing? Uh, robotics, I mean, they, they literally had no production space to do anything new. So they they kind of said, oh, well, try this Mirakami Wolf over there. You know, they might they might have some, you know, be able to work with you. So that's where Turtles got their start, but they got sent over there. And um, the Simpsons got sent to that other um, Klasky Chupo place. Mm -hmm. And then, then it took off. <laughs> but Mahaparachi, you know, go away kid, don't bother me. That kind of bad stuff back then. But uh, no, and I've met the um, 
the uh, one of the one of the East, I think it was Eastman. I get them mixed up. Anyway, we we met several times now. Really nice guy. I've met him at different conventions. We've taken pictures and talked about the old days, stuff like that. It's fun. Uh, so I guess the last question I have before we maybe transition to um, allowing the audience to ask questions is um, if, uh, let's see, well, I guess, um, yeah, well, what, what is the property that um, maybe you'd like to revisit most if you had the opportunity that you, you feel like you have more stories that you're hungry to tell? Oh, there'll be sex, man. Yeah. <laughs> We, uh, there's some stories I wanted to tell that we never got to. And if you're a follower of the X-Men, you might remember uh, Cyclops has a brother that he never discovered that he had a brother. And um, I always thought that's one of the stories I wish we had gotten to, t to, to tell in like, it's not a whole story, but at least maybe a subplot or something where they could, you know, get together and talk. Um, that, that's, that's one of the uh, stories I wanted to tell that we never got around to because we kind of set it up because the, the brothers fought each other but their powers couldn't hurt each other and they didn't put two and two together but the audience did but they didn't that that's probably one story um i think there are other stories after the x-men um oh god i can't remember the name but i think there was a there was a character that was really uh um he's like you, it was revealed to be Xavier, but it was a big bad guy in a giant red outfit. I can't remember what it's called. You know what it is. Onslaught. <laughs> Onslaught, that's it. That's it. You know, maybe pick it up on Onslaught, Onslaught and some other stories after the stories we did. It would be kind of fun, you know. Um, but, you know, it is it is what it is. And um, I don't know what they're going to do in the future, but I we put out all the flags saying, hey, Marvel, hey, Mar uh, Disney Plus. We're still alive, you know. Give us a call. <laughs> um, yes, so, yes. Um, so to interrupt for a moment, we're going to open the chat for questions. So, audience members, if you have a question, please feel free to just enter it into the chat, and we'll select questions and go from there. And while we wait for people to enter questions into the chat, I have a quick comment and then a question of my own. Um, X-Men wasn't just for kids. Uh, I loved animation. I still do. Saturday morning was my time of the week. Everybody just leave me alone. I'm watching my TV. <laughs> yeah. And when X-Men came around, it was a different type of animated narrative. I wasn't necessarily into anime per se, but the adult quality of the storytelling. Um, yeah. um, I remember Eric was doing his doctoral work out of Purdue and I went out there to give a talk and I was staying with him and I saw his bookshelves of DVDs and I said, oh, you're into X-Men? Of course, he had them all. <laughs> and then we started talking about all the fantastic themes that the show touched that just weren't being addressed in American television, but on American animation. So I have a question. You mentioned that um, sometime after X-Men, a lot of the animating work went overseas. And the question I have is, do, what impact, if any, do you feel that had on the on the quality of American animation, animated storytelling that went on in the in the slot of a Saturday morning type show between X Men and look for me, I'll just say Animaniacs. I do think that Animaniac right. brought back a certain adult vibe to American. Of course, there was always the stuff on Cartoon Network. I'll shut up. I just when do you <laughs> think did America get its mojo back, and when do you think that started to happen? Um, I. I, the first part of what you were saying about what, what we what the writers and I agreed on that we tried to do was that we wanted to never wanted to write down to kids. We want to write up to kids and wanted to write the stories to make them accessible, but make it mature enough that it you know it would be for like a an older older youth older uh, teenager that could be pulled into the story. But we never wanted to write down like you know Super Friends that kind of stuff. So we. That was very deliberate in, in that aspect. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, when the kids would watch the shows when they're very young, they'd see the, the eye candy of the explosions and laser beams and whatever. But when they would watch it 
you know, second or third time, they catch all this adult subtext that's in there and society subtext about, you know, relationships and um, society and, 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 and other aspects that you may not have picked up on the first time through. And I think that's what helped with this, its uh, longevity is that we, were, weren't, we weren't trying to write simple stories. We wanted to write something more complex and shades of gray as a shades of black and white, that kind of okay. stuff. Um, in terms of the um, animation leaving the, uh, sorry, the, uh, some of the work leaving the States, um, a lot of the, um, the animation, ink and paint, camera, um, got offloaded off to initially it went to, let's see, what country was it? Uh, oh, Korea was mm -hmm. the first country. I got to think because it's gone from it's gone from Korea to Japan to um, 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 other countries. Every time the every time the 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 uh, work got the people who worked in that country started asking for raises, mm. the production went to another country <laughs> with cheaper, you know. Yeah. But the thing is, is that when they did that, the expertise wasn't there, but the price was right, um, right, and so. What that did was, unfortunately, it it um, it did less of the lower the quality and also um, lower the the vision of what was possible. And it took it took you know shows like Batman and, and X Men to try and uh, show them that look, this kind of stuff can work, and you can make make it's profitable. You you can have dozens and dozens of Batman toys, because that's basically, they're always, always looking for ancillary revenue streams to supplement, you know, that supports the show. And so um, you can have both, you can have, it can be profitable and it could be entertaining. And so we did that in the nineties um, to, and, and to a degree people tried to emulate it and follow us, which is great. Cause I've, I've, I've never thought of the show as being like, this is the standard I figured we're the basement. So you guys after us just build and make it even better. You know, that's what I, that was always in the back of my mind that someone, here's what I did. You guys can take it to the next level. So. Excellent. Thank you. So Eric, do you want to read a question from the chat? So uh, one question is, um, um, could you say the person's name who wrote it? Okay. Yeah. Uh, so uh, uh, Jasmine Miller wrote, um, what's the hardest part about creating uh, animation? Oh, it is, uh, it starts with the writing, but the, um, because to me, if you don't have a good story, you put a lipstick on, on a you know what? And so it's, it starts with a good writer. If the writers, if the writer can write a good narrative, um, then like people like me, um, I, 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 I kind of like, I, I know what, what artists can do that were working for me. Like this guy can maybe draw a, background. So this one does, uh, can do, um, you know, character stuff best. This one can do action. This can do subtle stuff. And I would take the script and, and go through it. And then, okay, you do act one, you do act two, you do act three. And I try and give them the best parts of what I know they do best. Because what happens is that when I get the, when I get the storyboards back, not only did they do the script, but they actually tried to add to it to make it even better. So the hardest part for uh, for animation creatively is going to be the script, but the hardest part physically is the physical animation, which they offloaded that to the other countries. And the bad thing is that if you watch the X-Men um, and a lot of other shows, the quality is here, sometimes it's here, sometimes it's down here, you know, you just have no idea what you're going to get back. Um, people like uh, on Batman, the would like, like the X Men would pay about this much, and Warner Brothers would pay this much. So when it goes overseas, who do you think you're going to pay attention to when it goes overseas to get quality work? The guys were getting paid the big bucks, so money talks overseas, and so they would get better work. And and um, I knew that going in, and so I would have to take the storyboards and use my experience to. to to change the artwork so that instead of trying doing Disney fluid animation, 
I had to change it into a form that looked really dynamic, but maybe didn't move a lot. And I knew if I did that, I'd get very good looking scenes, the characters would be great, and it will still tell the story. And just uh, trying, I guess trying, um, like if you watch, if you remember anime stuff, a lot of times people are like in uh, Dragon Ball Z, people are talking and they don't move, the camera's panning this way, panning this way, panning this way up, and they do it over and over again, trying to uh, not spend a lot of money <laughs> over here, but then spending money when they start fighting over here. And I use that logic on the shows I worked on to try and um, get the best, pull the best out with a, our budget was not that, but it was not, was minor in comparison to Warner Brothers. So I had to do a lot, had to pull a lot of my experience in making the shows work really well and get the best bang for the buck. Um, so the hardest part about it, the real animation is actually the animation. I, by the time, just so you know, when, by the time someone starts a script, by the time you guys see it, there's nine months to make one episode. So it's That's fantastic. We, we have a lot to talk about when we discuss Miyazaki and May. Yes. The, the, the relationship between dialogue and motion on the screen is, is just masterful. Um, a stu uh, I'm missing Nicole Weiss would like to ask a question. Nicole, make sure you unmute before you begin. Hi. Hi. Um, has technology changed your job at all? Or like, do you see it changing it at all in the future? Oh, technology has changed it quite a bit. I mean, I was from the dinosaur age where we had paper and pen, and now people use the computer and a stylus to draw everything. So no, it's, it's changed it quite a bit. Um, the advantages for the computer is that you can draw on the computer, you make a mistake, you just hit undo and just start all over again. So it makes it um, really advantageous. Or you, you draw something, it's like, oh, it's the wrong size. And you shrink it or whatever you need to do to make it work. There's been a lot of good advantages to the technology for old people like me you know i'm used to paper and so i had to get used to um what i for what i call drawing on glass um because when you're drawing on paper you can kind of feel the paper but you know you go on a computer it's like like that and so i actually took sandpaper on my stylus and i roughed it up just so i could get some a feedback to when i'm drawing but there's, there's a lot of advantages to the technology. Yeah, uh, to, um, and it's, I mean, Pixar is an excellent example how they use the technology and they blended it with traditional animation and made something really popular, something really good. Um, you still will find in some of the preschool shows uh, that's still traditional um, hand animation um, out there. And it's, it's, it's helped, computers have helped quite a bit to create a lot more volume of, of work out there. Um, yeah, so yeah. Are you an artist? No, I was just curious. Oh, <laughs> okay. Um. Um, yeah, thanks, Nicole. Eric, there's a question from Paige Von Dresek, if you wanna read that one, oh, okay. or I can. Uh, let me just find it here, hold on. Oh, there we go. Um, are you working on the Eternals? If you are, have you worked on the animation for the Black Knight? Uh, that's easily answered. Nope, I'm retired, so I'm gonna watch it just like you are. I have no idea what they're doing, and I keep my fingers crossed that they're they're gonna do an, uh, a good job adapting the show, adapting the original manuscript to uh, into a movie. I'm I'm keeping my fingers crossed. The the person I have a lot of faith in at Marvel is a guy named Kevin Feige because he's been in charge of all the Marvel films from beginning to end and he is a fanboy and he's been able to um, incorporate the, 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 at the, the good parts of mythology of the comic books and blend it with the cinema and made, it, made, it, uh, made the films um, accessible to an audience that don't have, they don't read comic books. They have no idea what the hell, you know, Thor's <laughs> hammer is called majority, whatever the hell they call it. You know, he's been able to incorporate that and bring people into the into the uh, movies. And so I'm hoping that he's in, um, I think he's doing the Eternals. He's helping one of the directors on the Eternals. So I'm keeping my fingers crossed that it's going to turn out really good. You know, I've been watching like WandaVision and it's like episode four, it's like, ooh, 
this is getting really good, you know. Mm. So he's been in charge of that. He's been directing, he's been overseeing the director. So I have, I'm keeping my fingers crossed. Excellent. So Brie Billa asks the following question. How has COVID-19 impacted animation? I feel like a great portion of the entertainment industry has been left out of jobs, mostly in live action actors, but could this be a good thing for animators who can work online? Oh, it's been, for animation, it's been, um, it hasn't slowed them down at all. They've had to adapt and change um, because a lot of people have, well, I, sh I shouldn't say they have, but they've, they've uh, brought their computers home or either their own setups or the setups from the companies and they do their work remotely and because of the internet, once you finish your scenes, you upload it to their server, and then you know the director go through it and assemble it. Uh, for animation purposes, you don't really need to be in the same room with someone um, to complete the work, and so it's it works out really well. The pandemic just kind of underscored how how um, good it is to 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 you don't have to be in the same room, although. It, you know, my, when I grew up, it's always nice to be, you know, you can take a break or talk to your friends. It's also very social and uh, talk about stuff. How did you do this thing? What about this? You know, that kind of stuff. Um, and so the technology, the, the COVID um, hasn't affected production that much. That's what I'd say. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's affected it, but not to the point where it's, it's shut it down like it has in live action because, yeah. They've had, they have a lot more reasons, that, the restrictions, I should say, why the animation doesn't. Okay, Eric, um, do you have a question real quick? Eric Wesselman. Oh. <laughs> well, um, I guess one question I would have um, is, uh, you know, you've worked on a lot of properties, right? Obviously X-Men is, is near and dear uh, to your heart in many ways. Um, what's maybe another property that uh, you really enjoyed? One that maybe actually surprised you, perhaps uh, that you didn't. Oh, believe, um, there were several. Show, there were several shows that worked on that surprised me. Be, um, I had to roll them down here because I had to remember. I had to go through my IMDb to remember them. <laughs> uh, it was. A, I did a lot of preschool shows. I did a show called Salty's Lighthouse, uh, Fat Dog Mendoza. Uh, uh, leapfrog and I did Care Bears and those it's like total opposite from doing superheroes to doing Care Bears right but I found them to be quite enjoyable once I get into it and with the Care Bears I was able to there was a there was, we had a run on CBS I did 52 episodes there and then I liked it so much I did three Care Bear movies so that was a lot of fun and um, yeah so I'd, I'd say the preschool and very young audience shows i was surprised that i enjoyed it and i you know that i got hired for it <laughs> to begin with because it's like you just you just do capes and superheroes you know? what do you know about this stuff but it was fun so those... okay so eric i don't see any more questions in the chat um uh, let's see here oh I, got, I think there's a couple that have went further comments down. but not uh questions. Oh, here's a question um, from Li Zeng. What do you think is the biggest challenge adapting comics to movies? Oh, um, the biggest challenge is 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 taking trying to be faithful to the original material and uh, figuring out how to adapt it to another medium, which would be film and also you know, being knowledgeable that the people who are going to watch the movie don't necessarily know anything about the source material. So it's making the movie accessible to a larger audience. Um, that's one of the things you got to be careful for. Uh, I mean, unfortunately, there are a lot of directors who will take the original source material and change it because, hey, it's about me. So let me put me on the screen. They, they, their ego gets involved. They want to make it about them as, a, as opposed, no, about the show. And um, yeah, I've seen that happen over and over again. Unfortunately, it's like they, it's more of a statement about who they are. Um, when, I was, when I was working with the writers on the X-Men, we tried to remain as faithful as we could, even though the X-Men has like 
30, 40 years of, of continuity, we had to distill it down to something that a regular person could pick up on. They didn't know, they didn't need to know all the minutia here and there and there, but you distill it down to what was still faithful to the book and uh, put it on screen. And so um, that was my approach. It's like, you know, take the book, put it on the screen, don't change it, you know, uh, but change it if you have to, don't change it because you can. That's always been my philosophy. And so I, I know I'm not, this, I know I'm different from a lot of people out there, but I think if, if you can get a director that believes that you're going to get a good product out there. And, um, you know, I, I know Kevin Feige is not a director, but I think he set up the parameters so that when you did Iron Man and when you did Doctor Strange, they kept the core uh, mythology there, even though they opened it up with new stuff that wasn't necessarily accurate to the books, but it was a, it, there was enough core things that, that you felt like they were trying to be faithful to the source material. So yeah, um, I hope that answers that question. Um, yes, no, thank you very much. Um, so Eric, I'm going to be signing off. Um, I don't know if students expected this to end at eight, um, but I'm going to tell you, say thank you so much to Larry for being here. I can't <laughs> wait to talk to you about Miyazaki in May. And Eric, you are now the host. Make sure you clean the room and close the door and turn off the lights. <laughs> Everybody, thank you, Larry. Have a oh, you're welcome, man. Take care. Bye -bye. Take care. Mm -hmm. okay, I'll, I'll take this moment to say feel free to throw up the uh, hand clapping emojis if, if you got those uh, <laughs> um so i mean technically we've we've reached the end of our time um but if there are other people who have questions and if if uh mr houston's willing to hang out for a few more minutes uh we can keep it open so i'm good yeah i can i, I can hang out for a little bit longer it's it's um uh, still got sunlight coming out i'm not sure if it's uh it's only five o'clock here so on the west coast so um I'm trying to think if anything else to talk if you have any oh if there's any other questions i can uh answer for for you um i i, I remember the i think it's nicole who asked me the question about um computers and stuff mm -hmm. um my background believe it or not uh, when i left high school uh i i didn't become an animator i just i fixed computers for like seven years you know i 18 till I was about 24 years old. That's all I did. I did computers and somewhere near the end of the seventh years where I got bored with computers, believe it or not. And I wanted to try and um, see if I had it, if I could make it as an artist. And so I, I took a chance and quit. A, I tell people don't do what I did because <laughs> it's, I, I didn't want to give myself a, a a way to back out of it. So I actually quit a job and then I went looking for a job, which don't do that. <laughs> you look the job, then you quit. But I did it the other way because I wanted to force myself, you know, jump. I was jumping off the off the diving board. And I I went for it. I went for it uh, working for filmation and I got lucky um, to get in there. But yeah, it's I the one nice thing about having uh, been a computer repairman for like seven years is that when anim when anim uh, computers got into my business, I wasn't scared of it. There are a lot of people who were like, oh my God, computers are coming. They're going to take over our job. And I was like, don't, don't worry about it. They're just glorified calculators. <laughs> you know, it's it's the software that makes it uh, makes it powerful. I'm getting dark here. Let me turn on the light. <laughs> My sun is going down. I'm using the sunlight. Let me turn this on over here. Uh, now you're seeing all my junky room here. <laughs> oh, it looks wonderful oh, to me. I see oh. a bunch of stuff I'd love to have in my office. <laughs> yeah, a lot of that stuff, what it is, is that I, when I was working on different shows, like G.I. Joe, Transformers and stuff, the toy companies would just give us free stuff. And so what happened was I at in our offices, like we had all this GI Joe stuff and we would take it and push pin it on the wall. 
or we take it off like we had to draw the, um, the jets or the tanks, we take it and physically just look at it. You know, okay, I can get it. And how do you draw a dramatic shot of the tank and stuff? And so we had tons of toys. And then when the series ended, everybody took, took home their stuff. So I got uh, Buck Yo Hair, Swamp Thing, um, G.I. Joe, Superpowers, uh, Black Star, Robocop, um, what's that over there? Secret Wars, um, back there's Turtles. So I got a lot of toys, too many toys. <laughs> too I got no more room for toys in here. I got too many toys. But uh, yeah, so I was trying to answer the, the question that Nicole had once that uh, about computers. So I, I know you mentioned that you were um, retired, but uh, or I've seen sometimes uh, you said semi-retired, right? Are there any uh, passion projects, you know, things that, uh, you know, uh, you're really excited about um, coming out of retirement? <laughs> well, one of the things I in the eight, in the mid '80s, I created this uh, comic book through Charlton Comics. I got, I think it was Charlton Bullseye number four, and I created this group of uh, super powered female uh, freedom fighters that were um, the princess had joined with this uh, group of, of freedom fighters that were trying to stop her brother from starting a war. So it was like a it was like a a, a two part episode, and. Um, it was published, it was kind of fun, it's called The Vanguards. And so in my semi-retirement, I started, I wrote a, I wrote a couple of screenplays on them. And um, I got an agent, it got into, I think a CAA for them to read it. And then COVID hit and it's sitting there <laughs> for about the last year, you know, it, it hasn't gone anywhere because they're shut down, so. Um, I've been. I was writing that screenplay. I was writing some of my other comic book ideas into into scripts, making up some new stuff, um, and I, I just started drawing another graphic novel. Of, I created my own um, in high school. I created my own bunch of superheroes. I call them the Enforcers. And right now, I've been trying to draw more of them. You know, updated from way back when, because I was back in high school, and uh, so. Just getting around, you know, just I'm, I'm playing with it. Graphic novels take a long time to draw. I can tell you that. And so I'm playing around with, with the vanguards, the enforcers, and uh, some other projects that uh, hopefully something will happen with them, you know. But it's keeping me busy. COVID's keeping me, you know, bored. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, um, I got Netflix. I got Disney Plus. I got... HBO Max, I got all these things just to try and um, not go crazy in the house, you know, watching everything in the world. Um, and then we you know, sit home and start typing on on uh, screenplays and sketching up. So that's what I've been doing in, in all this time. Keeping myself busy, you know. I was I, I was I was really hopeful for the uh, for the vanguards to take off, you know, but we'll see. Maybe maybe they'll get to it near the end of this year when they open up stuff again. I hope so. I look forward to, to hearing more about it. Um, where can uh, where can they find more about you on social media and such? Oh, let's see. Um, my son set me up. I'm on Instagram. I think I'm, let me, where is the phone? Uh, oh, that's right. It was, here it is. I got to look at it to make sure I don't make a mistake here. But, um, on Instagram, I am, so I should have this memorized, right? Uh, LarryTunes54, that's where you'll find me. And on, I have a website which needs to be updated, but it's called uh, Larry-Houston.com. And so I have a website there, it's, it's, it's a little old, I got to update it, but it has some stuff on it. So those are the two places where, where you, Someone can find me, they can send me emails and stuff like that. And um, where I can, when I can, I on Instagram, I try and post stuff. Oh, that's right. I just got a Twitter. I just joined Twitter of all things, um, middle of this year, last year. And I'm under, I couldn't be, I'm, I'm, I couldn't be more uncreative. My name is X-Men Director. <laughs> 
that's what it's called. I couldn't figure out any other creative names. Like, okay, fine. I'll just get that. So those are the places where you can find me and tweet questions and stuff. I, at least on Twitter, I've been, when someone sends me questions, I try and answer it within a day or a couple of hours or minutes. Just depends if I'm on online at, at the time. And um, so that's, that's where you can find me. All right, well, if there's uh, um, no other questions, um, uh, I want to thank you again um, uh, for hanging out with us, for sharing your experience uh, is with us, and um, I look forward to chatting with you again sometime. Okay, I appreciate it. I'm glad to have met, meet everyone with the questions and talk about it. Uh, Jamie, you didn't have any questions there. I see your name there. You <laughs> look like you could be an artist or something, you know, but, uh, you know, I, I, this is the one thing I, I missed from the conventions being, um, uh, you know, all, you know, they were all canceled. Is that I love going to conventions and talking to uh, people about the shows and what I did. And if I have any insight to helping them become a better artist or writers, giving them leads, I love pouring out the information because I remember what it's like being on the other side of the table talking to talking to the professionals so you know when i go to conventions it's whatever you want to know i'll pour it out and give it to you so because i want you to be a better uh a better um i won't say a better artist but a better uh help you succeed in your goals and i'll do whatever i can to help everyone who comes up to talk to me <laughs>